I wanted to kind of start at the end of the memoir. And Jim, at the end of the memoir, you say that the memoir signals the end of four decades of silence. And this is common among, among I think, combat veterans generally, but you hear it a lot from Vietnam vets. These days, my general impression is that Vietnam vets come back and for whatever reason, they do just become silent. And I, I wanna ask you about why you did, but then the decades go by, um, retirement comes, um, just given where we are in life, just as a fact of life, there's more life behind us at a certain point than there is ahead of us. And so we're looking back, reflecting more on our lives because we're in retirement, we have more time to reflect on life maybe. Uh, thinking about you know, how our lives went, et cetera. And my sense, and I'm interested to know if, if you agree with this, my sense is that a lot of veterans, when it does come around to retirement, retirement age, that's when they actually find themselves thinking more about the war. Um, I don't know if that's, if that's the case for you, but let's, let's begin with this, Jim. I mean, what accounted for the four decades of silence? Why, after coming home from the Vietnam War, did you, or were you silent about it? Well, when I, uh, when I came home, the way we were treated really uh, snuffed me, so to speak, socially. I didn't want anything to do with, with people anymore. I, I went about my business uh, uh, in work. Um, I was a pilot. Uh, I flew for 44 years. I got over 25,000 hours in my logbook. Mm. You know? And um, I, I found time in the 80s, like 80, 81, 82, somewhere in that area, where I, uh, I, I sat down and I wrote. And I wrote everything that I could re possibly remember, every single thing. And I wrote for, for a couple of years off and on and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages, you know, scores of poems, all kinds of things. And then that, that brought me, uh, that settled me down. And, uh, and, I, and I went on about my business of supporting my family and getting them out and going. And, uh, and then when we got to retirement, our retirement point, um, we, uh, we weren't looking at a, a resolution of the Vietnam conflict thing. We were looking at what did Dan and I want to go do? And we bought a boat, we sold our house, our cars, our furniture, hopped on our boat and left. Uh, I got, I wound up with uh, blood clots. So we had to sell the boat, come back ashore and, 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 and do other stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I eventually got around to where I was digging through looking for something. And I found these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of stuff. And um, so I, so I decided to start working on it. And I, you know, I queried Anne if, you know, Hey, I want to do this now and see what we, what comes up. And, uh, um, and, you know, and I would, one of our friends said, Hey, you need to get Anne's input in this. And mm -hmm. I'll, let her, I'll said, let her speak for herself. No on this. way. I am not going back there again <laughs> in my mind, anywhere. I'm not going back there. That was the worst year of my life. And, um, I said, no, I'm not going to do it. But then I realized that those of us, not just me, we have stories too. And those stories are not being told. Those stories are not even being recognized. And I said, okay, I will write mine. And maybe it will encourage other people to see that there is more to what they're looking at. There are, I think, a, a, a lot of women in the position you're in who had to live through that year, that 13 months or longer. Um, and that experience, in my mind is part of the, the entire Vietnam experience. And I agree with you that those are stories that, that need to be told as well. So I hope that other uh, spouses of Vietnam vets will hear what you say and will, um, will be encouraged to share their stories. Jim, why, what motivated you to, to, to do this though? Why not just let those pages be if they, if they served a certain purpose um, at that time, why? Why expend the effort now 
for decades further on to pull it together into a memoir that you would share with others? Well, um, we uh, we attend uh, uh, off and on. We attend Vietnam helicopter pilot reunions. Yeah. And uh, there'll be a thousand pilots there. There'll be a thousand wives and then there'll be a thousand other family members there. It's, it's a big deal. But out of all of those thousand pilots, there's only going to be like 20 Chinook pilots. Mm -hmm. And so we looked at the, I looked at the literature. And in fact, anytime I wanted to read about uh, Vietnam history, why it was always Huey's or, right. or it was, you know, it was some gunship thing. So, right. so I, you know, I uh, talked to some of my, my Chinook buddies that I've known ever since, you know, the flight school. Yeah. And, and, um, uh, you know, we all agreed that, the, that, that there wasn't anything out there. So I, uh, I, I talked to a bunch of my friends to get their perspectives on things. And then, uh, then Anna and I decided to, to start writing it. And <laughs> I can tell you, is we have a footlocker that we packed around since day one. Mm -hmm. And in it, we wound up with all of our tapes all of our letters, okay. When we open, when we open that, there's a there's a scene in in Ghostbusters one where they're in the fire department, and the uh, and the uh, the administrator is finding them, and he turns off their containment, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that lock on the front of that was our containment. Mm -hmm. We open the lid. All those memories came out. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what difference, if any, did it make in Jim to go from a position of silence about the war? Maybe I'll write about it privately, but I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to write about it for public consumption. Um, so that's that's what's going on for decades. And then now, you know, here we are um, at the, you know, uh, beginning of a discussion about that time in Vietnam. As you observed, did it make any, did it make any difference? What, what, what impact did it have finally saying, okay, this is something I'm willing to write publicly about. This is something I'm willing to speak publicly about. I think that it kind of went two ways. One is it, it was a story that really hadn't been told and needed to be told. And so he wasn't just doing it for his own look at me thing. It was look, this is part of something that people don't know. And they're all saying, thank you for your service, but they have no idea what that means. Mm. It's just words. Sure. Yeah. And I think when he got there, he um, decided he was going to to let people know the truth about that part of the war that they didn't really know about. So he started writing his book, and people were saying to him, "Well, Annie's got to write her got to do too." The writing didn't scare me, but yeah. those ghosts. I didn't know if I could face those ghosts in. For him, I was worried too, and and we we had a lot of tears together because we both had it, the ghosts all came back, and but we found that by doing what we did and by doing it together, that the ghosts are still there, but they don't have the power that they had over yeah. us. So it sounds like. I have, there's one veteran I can remember who said that, and it's interesting because he would be very willing to come to class and share, but he would tell me every time I do that, it just makes things worse. Um, but normally what I, usually what I hear um, is that sharing and talking about it, as you say, doesn't make it go away, but it does um, perhaps, Oh, I don't know. I don't know what the right way to, to express this is. It doesn't make it go away, but it's less of a burden. Have have you have you found that to be the case that by sharing it, it's not that it's 
that the burden goes away, but that somehow the burden maybe maybe comes a little bit lighter as perhaps you share a little piece of it with other people. Does does that resonate at all with your experience? I think that yes, it does absolutely. Um, as a as a product or a, of of our uh, memoir, um, I've gotten. I got two emails from people that were in the bunker where the mortar didn't go off. Mm. Uh, I got, uh, um, I, I actually has sat and had a discussion uh, with uh, uh, this, this war, war protester who, who our book took him from looking at, looking at the government or the soldier at that time as some sort of a, of a, of a monolith uh, made of rock as part of the government rather than as a human being made of flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. And it turned his head completely around. Um, that kind of that kind of a perception, uh, I ran into a special forces guy that I that that we helped save their lives. Um, that kind of thing. It, well, ma it makes it all worth it. it. Makes it made it all worth it. Having written that book, and we have gone out to places mostly on camp on um, no bases mm -hmm. and and also in bookstores and that stuff. And we had one. I'll just tell you a couple of examples. One is we had a guy come up, and we have a, a poster built, you know, with the cover of the book, and he was really looking hard at the poster, and and Jim said. Um, said, you know, when were you there? And he was talking about it. And they, turns out, he was in the same place the same time Jim was. And Jim actually hauled him out of it. And we would never have seen that guy. We have never done that. So we've had some really deep rewards for what we did, but we've helped other people in ways we didn't expect. We had one girl stand, well, what, well she's, like maybe 40, she's not a girl, but you know, we're old now. And um, she just kind of was, we could see her standing and staring and watching us and looking at the thing. And, you know, we didn't know what was going on, but that's okay. So then she came up when she was the only one and she says, I'm going to say this. I don't want you to say anything. I don't want you to ask any questions. I don't want you to, you know, and when she was shaking and I thought, my gosh, what have we done to this poor woman? Mm. And she said, well, she said, my dad served in Vietnam. And what did she say? He, he was a door gunner. He was a door gunner yeah, on a, a helicopter. helicopter. And she said, and um, and I read your book. And she said, now I understand. And she and and I said, well, now you can tell him. She says, he died already. And she's got the book to give her mother so her mother could understand better. So they'd gone through all of that and still hadn't had any resolution. We had a, we had a gentleman uh, uh, tell us that, that his brother had just died. He had also been a helicopter, in fact, a Chinook tour gunner. And, uh, and he, had, he had over the years told his brother's stories and his brother didn't believe him. And he stood right there in front of us saying that it turned him completely around. Mm. It is important to uh, to to share these stories, and so that's why I'm glad that you know you wrote the memoir and that you're you're I'm willing to talk with me. And a minute ago, uh, you used the word ghost. You referred to ghosts, um, ghosts related to Vietnam. Um, Jim, when you were talking about opening up that locker where you have the letters and the tapes and things like that. Um, sort of the way you talked about it is you take the lock off and you open that thing up and it's almost like, you know, the ghosts come out and sort of, sort of thing. Um, what are these ghosts? Um, what, 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 what are the personalities of these ghosts? What do these ghosts do? The, the, the ghosts, I think that that I that I am describing is um, the the ghost of not being understood, not being appreciated, uh, having what you thought for a year of survival at its base. It that that when you came home, you would have a way to reconcile 
all the things that changed in you and we never got to. And that is the, the uh, you know, excuse the expression, monkey on everyone's back. Uh, and there was a point uh, in, in our American history where the nation all of a sudden said, oh, we love you guys now. And, um, and, every, and everybody was slapping the Vietnam veterans on the back. And um, I think that out of, the, out of, I could pick 10 veterans that I've known uh, ever since the war uh, and some prior to it, who absolutely said, well, okay, but it, it's meaningless. It's absolutely meaningless. It's, it's so far away from where we needed it. Now, you know, I'm at my, I'm 76 now. Uh, people tell me when they see you, when I have a, something on my hat, uh, thank you for your service. Um, it's, it, it's recognition and I thank them. And, and, I, and I thank them. I think it means a lot to be validated. The first time somebody said to Jim, Thank you for your service. It was very touching. It was, um, we'd gone to a 4th of July reunion and a parade and it was in San, San Antonio. And um, they, got, they had all the, all the veterans that came, the, the helicopter pilot veterans marched in the parade. And when they got to the, the city, there was a, a, a round in the center of, of it where they went. And this little girl, she must have been eight years old, I'd say, walked up to Jim and said, thank you for your service. Mm. Yeah, was that was beautiful. Too cute. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's the, 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 the you know, I, I don't want to, um, there was so much blood lost. I mean, just look at the Vietnam War wall. Right. Uh, uh, that, that the people that were peripheral to that, the ones that survived. It didn't matter which number you were in the one to 10. One guy sitting in a foxhole, number 10 guy typing the orders that got him there. It doesn't matter about the not number of people. What matters is that is that the consequence of their service was never appreciated. And um, you can tell somebody, you know, 10 or 15 years later, gee, we're we're sorry, we're, we love you, blah, blah, blah. It, when, uh, when, you, when, they, when they were telling you that they did not appreciate your service, it was like you were inside of a, a mortar with a pistol coming down and grinding you and grinding you. And they just loved grinding you. They loved watching how they could change your brightness into some sort of trauma. And, uh, you know, I don't mean to be that dark, but that's, that's the feeling, that's the loss where we consider ourselves patriots. We were working for our country. And there was a time in the war where we stopped holding ground and we would go and take a thing, put in a fire base, then move it. Lose all kinds of people going in, lose all people while they were there, lose people when we were coming out, just to go to someplace else and recreating the same the same havoc. Now, Jim had a special problem, so to speak. Well, I guess we want to say a problem, a challenge, just say, is that he had a dreams of being a, a, not a helicopter, a pilot. This is his, himself. He, he is, his soul is a pilot. And it didn't matter if it was helicopters or fixed wings or whatever. He's flown both. He's flown commercially fly as a pilot. You cannot have any time, anything on any record and maintain yourself as a pilot. You lose your license, you lose your life. Livelihood, I guess you could say. You can't, you have to have, pass a, a very strict health exam. And, and rightfully so in the sense that people don't want to be crashing all over the place, you know. 
Mm -hmm. But he could not go see somebody to help him if he was having a problem dealing with something. Because if he did that, that means he would lose. His whole point that he did sign up to enroll in the military and did serve as a pilot and got all that time as a helicopter pilot, he, they wouldn't put him in as a fixed wing because he didn't have his college degree yet. He got that with the GI Bill and then he was qualified and he could fly for the airlines. That was his life. That was his dream. So if, if, I, if I hear what you're saying, um, Jim gets the flying, gets his flying experience in Vietnam, not just flying experience, but flying experience often in a context of combat, um, including um, at least one instance, maybe more of the Chinook being effectively shot down. Do I have that right, I, Jim? I think so. So not just flying, but flying in, in that kind of context. If I hear what you're saying then, then post-war as he pursues a flying career, if war memories, war experiences are bothering him, it would be dangerous for him to talk about that because then somebody might put a label on him that then could jeopardize his career as a pilot. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm, exactly. Well, let, let me give you let me give you more an exact example of this. When when uh, when I got uh, out of college, while I was in college, I was looking for uh, looking for work to go out of college into, and and there were a lot of companies starting up in in South uh, in uh, Southern California, and any part of California. And, uh, and I uh, was interviewed, uh, actually interviewed by three different helicopter companies in Southern California, where the guy goes, oh, I didn't know you were in Vietnam. Just get the hell out of here. We don't want you guys. We don't want you guys. Just get the hell out of here. And that was the way that we were treated. So, so you don't tell anybody about yourself. You, so what happened is that I wound up flying with an outfit called Columbia Helicopters. And everybody, with the exception of a few pilots, was all they were all Vietnam veterans because the via the service, the military service was the only ones that had tandem rotor helicopters. You tell them what you were doing. And we were helicopter logging. We pioneered logging. We pioneered forest fighting. We pioneered uh, um, structure uh, towers. We pioneered putting up uh, um, transmission lines. We did all this with with, dams. with Chinook. We did built dams. I. You know, I, we did all kinds of things with uh, with helicopters, and the only people that knew how to fly those were all ex-military. So we had a we had a common ground. Everybody there knew everybody had had experiences. Everybody, so we would we would take care of one another. We would we would sit and talk. We would take care of one another. Our second book that we wrote is about that. It's about that coming back, and getting into a, an environment where where you fit in, you felt like a human being, you felt like you were 100% invested. And yeah, and Jim, I mean, you not only had this experience that you just described, um, but also in your memoir, you say that you were one of the veterans who actually was spit on by protest. I spit on, I was spit on. And you know, I've had probably 20 or 30 people tell me that never happened. That never happened. Nobody would ever do that. They, Nobody would they ever were, do they that. They were there, of course. You know, uh, <laughs> it was that's the kind of treatment. They, one, they don't believe you. Number two, they 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 destroy what you did for your country, with your honor. They try to destroy your honor. Uh, which when you start looking at the when you start looking at the statistics for suicide, veteran suicide, what's that all about? What's that all about? This is an honorable, uh, soldiering is an honorable profession. It's one of the highest that you can attain as far as serving your country. So, well, at the level of just basic human psychology, um, this is the most intense experience of your life. Um, it's at a formative stage of life. And if, if you go decades and feel like it's something that you can't talk about, um, obviously that's going to take a toll. We've mentioned a couple times the 
thank you for your service phenomenon. And during the Gulf War of the early 90s, there was talk about, you know, the Vietnam syndrome is behind us. I think that was premature. But there was, you know, the, the yellow ribbons for the troops. And, you know, that was one of those, um, you know, pretty easy conflicts in and combat doesn't last very long. Uh, casualties are, you know, certainly compared to Vietnam, quite low. Troops come home, the big parades, et cetera. 9-11, um, Afghanistan, Iraq, and then the thank you for your service um, phenomenon sort of gets going. How do y'all um, respond to that? Jim, if you are, if you're wearing a Vietnam veterans hat or if you have something on that indicates you um, as a, or that indicates that you are a Vietnam vet and folks, maybe a cashier at the store, you know, says that to you or, and you hear that said, um, some veterans really appreciate it. Some veterans have come to hate it um, because they feel like it's sort of become a trite cliche. Others say, well, that may be true, but I still appreciate that people say it. Um, how, how do you all think about this? Um, thank you for your service phenomenon. Anytime someone says thank you to me, I accept it. It's not, I, I thank them for their generosity. That's it. Yeah. They don't have to say anything. They can just be mute. But uh, I, I think that among the, uh, among the veterans, what they would prefer to hear is welcome home. I've heard that. I've heard that's that. what they prefer to hear is that's, welcome home. That's what I say to Vietnam veterans is welcome home. I really, but I say to their wives, thank you for your service. Because we also served by taking over the home front. Yeah. And I don't think that's recognized at all. Yeah, if someone, if the, the, I don't take it as a pleasantry. I take it as something from their heart. Well, now it's more like that. You know, the, to be that. Because of the times that we're in and why the reason that they're saying it. Yeah. A, lot of the, a lot of the people that are telling me this weren't even alive when I was doing this. So, um, so I, I, it, to me, I'm grateful for the recognition. Thank you very much yeah. for taking the time. Thank you. 